some students, however, go as far as uh, giving us permission to post the stories on YouTube or Facebook. So, um, so anyway, initially, we're going to show them a digital story, and uh, Gail's going to put up a document that will illustrate a bit how we work with the stories at this initial phase of the project. The students often are put in small groups and with it, they predict what the content of the story will be. Of course, they have questions which help their listening comprehension, questions about the story, but we also give them questions about the story to relate the story to their own individual experience. They also, here are some examples of questions they might discuss in small groups. They also will work on the vocabulary in the story. They may um, read texts about themes that come up in the story. And they all, we also ask them to analyze the story to see how the story was put together and how certain creative choices can achieve certain effects. So in other words, they look at how student or they look at how images and sound can be combined to convey meaning and specific emotions and tone. Yeah, I'll let you take it from there. Okay. Um, okay, so as we go into the project, um, we have students do story circles, obviously. Um, those students make their individual stories. Digital storytelling projects are very interactive, as you all know. We loosely follow the story center model, and story circles are a really important, powerful part of this model. They're instrumental to building community, engendering empathy, and creating a safe space which fosters language acquisition. We generally have two story circles in a class. The first one is for students to develop and discuss their ideas with their class. Students often have, more, often have more than one idea and want their classmates' opinion on which is the most interesting. The second story circle is where students read their scripts. Reading their stories aloud in English is an empowering experience for many. Stories that they write are often quite personal giving students the chance to connect on a deeper level. Story circles are often the highlight of the class for students, a time to bond with their peers. And we've discussed the possibility of having a third one in which students discuss the images, media, and media they plan to use. Depending on how large the class is, story circles can be done in smaller groups rather than in the whole class and peer input is often just as important as instructor input. So as we work on developing the story, there are multiple components that provide language learning experience in creating a digital story, and each plays an important role. There's the writing. We ask students to revise their scripts after sharing them in the second story circle. And they often revise and revise and revise, which is different from the academic writing that they do. Um, when they don't seem to want to re revise at all any of their writing assignments, they seem a lot more invested in the piece of writing they do for a digital storytelling project. And the scripts are sometimes the best, most well-developed writing that they do in the course and often more interesting than any of the other papers they write. So next is the pronunciation. Language learners are often self-conscious of their pronunciation and want to improve it. Digital stories are a good way for students to specifically work on pronunciation. And we encourage students to practice reading their scripts aloud before recording them, either in class or on their own. Then there's the media component, the visuals and the sounds. Some students seem to find selecting and creating the images for their digital stories daunting. Others love this aspect of the project. Uh, we often push students to think in terms of images that are not strictly speaking representational, but rather those that suggest feelings, meanings, tone, 
In doing so, students develop multiple literacies and greater critical media awareness. We often have to discourage students from using too many images. Digital storytelling requires a type of choreography, as, all, as you all know, I know this, <laughs> in which all the elements need to work together to create something beautiful. And often they create, they want to use so many that we're in, when we're inundated with too many images, it can be distracting and weaken the power of the piece. And then there's working with technology. Students improve their technical skills with editing software we use we video, and they gain a lot of self-confidence through the process. So they become empowered <laughs> and students come to the table with diverse strengths. Some are technically savvy, others have strong language skills, some have great public speaking abilities in their own, their first languages. And because there's so many opportunities for students to work together, they can help one another. I had one class where I had a large class and one student, a woman from Ghana, she was an older woman who was a nurse and she had very good language skills, but her, she had no um, experience with the computer at all. And she, I ended up pairing her with a student who was from Turkey, a young man who had very good technical skills and less weaker uh, language skills. And it was a perfect pairing. And they both felt extremely empowered by their ability to help the other. And then there are the students who are not so engaged at the beginning of the course, but through the digital storytelling experience, they gain confidence and become more engaged. So the process ends up being quite a bit more important than the finished product. And we try to encourage students at each juncture um, and create a supportive environment where students feel safe to share. Finally, at the end of the course, we screen the stories and each student introduces her story by talking about her process and her experience in making a story. Students are very enthusiastic about saying, this is a great way to learn English. Um, one aspect that we feel is particularly important is the identity aspect, because digitals, the project allows students to bring in their multiple identities into the classroom. The stories often incorporate their first language and they discuss personal relationships. And these are things that are often downplayed or even not expressed at all in academic discourse. Um, the stories allow the students to foreground identities other than that of language learner or immigrant. And finally, by creating a piece of art in English, the students often develop a greater sense of ownership of English, feeling like, yes, this too is my language. And Gail, give us an example. Uh -huh. So we, when I had, I had a screening in the class and the, and the student I was mentioning earlier, the nurse from Ghana, she was so proud of her project that when we were screening it um, afterwards, and she was talking about, she was addressing the class. Um, she physically turned her chair around and so she could formally address the class. And she said, life is a journey. It has ups and downs. And she was speaking in a very, this voice of a very seasoned storyteller. And she went on to explain her process and field questions from her classmates. And it was a truly joyful, empowering experience for her. And, and now we are ready for the video, if you can show it. This is the video that went with the curriculum sheet that we showed earlier. And this was made by one of Gail's students. Can you guys launch the video or shall we try to do that? Oh, I think we have the shared screen. So I think we need to do it, Gail. Oh, okay. Oh, no, it says I can't. Okay. Oh, but it is coming up. Oh, yeah, she's doing. Great, thanks. I was almost 38 and I thought I would die right there. But 
something inside me was saying, you can do it, keep trying. I bought special new shoes and started my training. First of all, I had to slow down. Regular running is not about speed or pace. It's about enjoying it. If you want to continue for years, it's useful to have your own goal. My goals were to run five kilometers and then 10 kilometers. I started to race. My first race was a five kilometer race open for public in the center of Prague. It was amazing. I achieved my first goal. I was 40 years old and I did it. I was so proud. But after that, it was so hard to keep running. I didn't have motivation. I didn't want to run a half marathon. I decided not to think it over so much and just run. And suddenly something happened. Something changed. I realized that anytime I was running, I didn't know where I was running, when I was running, or who was there. I didn't feel pain, nothing. It was like a soul without a body. There was only pure me and my breath. From these special days, I know that if I need to think over something, if I need to be with myself, I have to go around. It's my alternative world where I live alone, me and my thoughts. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, so our next presenters are, are Patrick Young and Caroline Nixon. And their, their presentation is called Storifying Research Findings for the General Public in an English, English for Academic Purposes course for pre-service speech language pathologists. Um, so thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, um, depending on where we are. So, um, so um, in our presentation today, we are going to talk about um, digital storytelling and also language learning, but we are not talking about the general language learning that our previous speakers have talked about. We are more interested in the digital storytelling applied in an academic um, context. So um, we are going to talk about um, a course that uh, Caroline and I have taught and developed in the past few years. Uh, we will also share with you some of um, the teaching materials and student work as to how we prepare students to uh, produce a digital story. And finally, we would like to reflect on some of our experiences as course teachers. Um, the course that we want to talk about um, is for speech and hearing sciences students. So these are pre-service speech language pathologists. So in this course, they are taught um, to carry out a research study, and then they need to uh, learn how to write an academic research report and also to produce um, an academic presentation. Uh, when we carry out research, I think one very important thing is we do need to share our research findings to others, and we do need to disseminate um, what we've learned from our research studies. So uh, in traditional academic sense, uh, very often it is the researchers who share their research findings to the research communities. But then um, as we have the more open science culture around the world, and then there are actually more and more and different consumers of research, including non-academics like parents, teachers, and the general public. Uh, when we care about research, of course, we care about stakeholders' engagement. Uh, we want to target um, the research so we want to share the research findings, not to scholars, not to academics, but to the more general public. So as such, we do need to consider whether or not the traditional form of uh, academic oral presentation would be helpful and would be desirable. So uh, because we want, to, we, want to sh we want our students to learn how to talk to the general public, so um, we do we consider um, the message, the channel and the format of the oral presentation. Um, in the traditional academic sense, then there will be in conference presentation, uh, conference presentations like what where we are at now. 
but then, but then for the more contemporary ones, then I think more and more researchers do share their research findings in more contemporary means, like infographics, like podcasts, like maybe a TED talk, um, avenues like these. There has also been calls in the research community that we do need to be more innovative in our dissemination of research findings. So uh, we might want to have, so we might want to remix traditional outputs that we consider other forms of, of a, a rather multimodal nature of sharing things. Uh, we might want to be more visual in communicating our ideas. After considering all these, then we come up with the idea of using a digital story as a way to present uh, research findings to the others. And this is why we have the title Story Find Research Findings. We believe that with digital stories, we are able to do all these rework for this research conference. So in this research conference, so in this conference, then, um, then we have some rewords like reconnect, rebuild, recreate revive, restore, recover, and rewrite. And we believe that digital stories are a very powerful way of doing all these things. Um, the previous speakers have all talked about the benefits of stories and storytelling. Perhaps uh, I can just be very brief on this part. So we all love stories. We all tell stories. We are all fascinated by stories. So that's why we consider storytelling as a pretty powerful way of sharing research findings. Unlike the traditional form of um, general uh, language courses where the storytellers talk about their personal experience. And in this course, we get the students to carry out research and then they are sharing the stories of their research participants. In, we deliberately do this because we do want our students to develop a sense of empathy. They are going to be speech pathologists later, so they do need to build a good relationship with their patients and they need to understand their patients' um, issues and problems. So we believe that if the students are taught how to narrate others' stories, um, they can build their confidence and research studies did indeed show there's very powerful benefits of stories. Um, stories do encourage our imagination, our creativity, and help communicate our thoughts so that we can empathize with unfamiliar people, places, etc. Digital story is just the use of digital elements to add impact to a story, to enrich the story, um, to make it more appealing to the younger generation or to the more contemporary world. Um, I, very, I like this quote very much, that digital stories actually combines the best of two worlds. The new world is actually the digital media and the old world is actually telling stories. Digital, story, digital storytelling combines these two modes of meaning making in communicating our ideas. As mentioned by the previous speakers, uh, yes, digital stories can tap into the language learning component. So um, the, the storytellers would need to use uh, language, their tone of voice, need to communicate the emotions. But at the same time, they also need to do something more, which is to use different multimodal resources to create meaning and to express subtlety in um, their emotions. And we feel that that's a very good way um, to, for our students and also a very good way of communicating research ideas to the general public. Digital storytelling has been used in higher education in many, many different domains. Uh, presenting others' ideas seems to be a rather new way. So that's why we made an attempt to do that and now, Caroline will take us through what the course actually is and how we prepare our students to produce an effective story. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, just to let you know, Patrick is controlling the slides, so I will give a thumbs up when I'm going to ask Patrick to move to the next one. Is that okay? <laughs> Patrick, perhaps you can jump in if I start to go a bit too much off topic, okay? So I'd just like to um, briefly introduce how the digital story fits into the course. Um, as you can see here, we're, we're really looking at this experiential learning cycle. And you can see that the digital story 
it's kind of one of the end products of um, of the course and of the small scale research projects that the students um, that undertake through the course. Um, you might notice here, looking at the the different stages, is that the a lot of the course and a lot of the assessment weighting is quite heavily focused on academic writing. So it's things like um, how to write an introduction, literature review, language of research reports. Um, we also give input on how to um, conduct methodology and how to um, how to conduct a project using qualitative data. So the students might be familiar with the more formal academic um, communication, like formal academic writing. They may not be familiar with qualitative data or dealing with qualitative data. And um, many are really quite unfamiliar with the format of digital stories. So um, in a moment, I'll just uh, explain why um, that some activities that we use to try to introduce these things. Um, so I'd also like to explain why digital stories are particularly effective for qualitative research that, that we find in the course is that um, students many times, especially if they're very focused on assessment or very focused on um, exams, they tend to want to get the right answer and they tend to want to talk about the facts. But in this course, when they're dealing with qualitative data and they're dealing with people, um, we find that the digital story really helps them connect to the human experience. And this, this is also really beneficial because it kind of guides them in how to write their um, interview questions for their qualitative data. Because we're not, we're not looking at the description. We don't want a description. We want the, of the facts. We want the real story. We want the human story behind it. Um, so you can see here, just to let you know on the right, there's, um, there's a list of possible topics that students might be interested in. Um, they need to find relevant literature. They need to address a research gap. Um, but again, it's not really about describing. I'll, I'll give an example um, that I encountered uh, when we taught the course in semester one last year, is that um, one student wanted to describe uh, the experience of um, what happens with speech therapists in schools. And when they came to me with their proposal, it, it seemed very descriptive. They were mostly looking at the facts. So we talked about the digital story and um, telling the human story. And I said, so, if I want to know these facts, I can just go to local websites and I can find out what happens in, in local schools with speech therapists. So um, that's not the most valuable part. The most valuable part is how do these speech therapists feel? What's what's their daily, you know, what happens in their daily life? What challenges do they deal with? And um, what, what kind of support do they need? Okay. All right, thanks, Patrick. <laughs> OK, so um, just to introduce some of the materials that we give, uh, we introduce the, um, the digital story and, and kind of the details of what, what's expected on, on what they need to do at the beginning of the course. Um, because it's an assessed task, we need to stick to these guidelines and we need to be very clear about what's expected. Um, so when we introduce this, um, this information here, it's just a brief overview. The, the part that I like to focus on is about um, finding the purpose and deciding of the purpose uh, on the purpose of the story because once they have that once they know what they want to do with it um, and once they know that they have to get the human element it kind of helps guide um, it guides their whole project and it kind of guides them along as they go okay so i think we'll go on to the next we'll just give it the next slide. okay so um so we kind of work um, when we're breaking down. So what, what goes into a digital, a digital story? What, what makes a digital story a digital story? Uh, we look at this um, visual storytelling framework. Um, and very briefly, it's kind of broken into three, three phases or stages. Uh, one of the big things I like to focus on is the um, understanding the conflict and resolution. And in the, in the video that we just watched, I just picked up on when, um, when the woman was running and she had a revelation. So what's, what's the turning point in the story? What's the big change that happens? Um, for our students, we kind of, um, we focus on what's, what's the problem, what's the conflict, what's the difficult thing that um, the people are experiencing and how do they overcome that? Or how do they, they might not overcome it, but what kind of solutions do, um, do they find to get past that? Um, and I find that for our students, that's particularly useful because, um, they may be used to writing things like academic essays or even from school when they were at high school, they might be used to writing as like problem solution essays with rather generic, um, slightly vague general solutions. But here in the story, we ask them to think of the personal, real 
um, appropriate valid solutions, which is, oh, okay, we're, I'm, I've got one minute left, <laughs> okay, I'll skip one. Okay, thanks, if we go to the next slide, Patrick. Okay, so basically in these three stages, very quickly, um, we look at, we basically take a genre analysis approach and we look at examples. I'm sure many of you already do this if you're teaching. Um, we look at examples and we dissect the examples um, so that students can have an idea of, of, and they can get some inspiration. So you'll notice that from some of these questions, it's what do you notice and how do you feel about it? So there's, there's really no right answer. Um, this is just to give some inspiration. OK, I'd like to show you then the storytelling canvas, which is really useful. And it's basically it kind of works as a checklist. Um, the part I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but the part I like to focus on is before and after. Again, this was like the, the previous speakers um, thinking about the change that you'd like to see as a result of the video. Um, so I find this is also a good thing to focus on to to help students identify the purpose. Another thing that you can highlight is here is the call to action. So um, what do you want people to do as a result of watching the video or, or after after you watch the video, what, um, what do you want to inspire? OK. Um, OK, if we can go on to the next one, I think I might have time for one. OK, so I think we'll stop after this one. So basically in this stage of um, thinking of the topic, think about what goes into a video, then we, we do some practice of delivery. And this is a, a nice activity that we use to um, basically get students to act. Um, I mean, I find that normally in any kind of academic presentation, if students have to talk, they get very nervous. And I just say to them, just, just, you need to do a little bit of acting. You need to pretend that you're somebody else. And so we can get them to read the voices. Um, luckily in semester one last year, we were actually on campus, we weren't on Zoom. So things like this can um, can be a really fun way to get them used to using their voice and to, to, um, to acting a little bit. Okay, I think, um, yeah, I think maybe that's all we have time for. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, it occurs to me that if we're putting this content, if we're putting the whole conference in the Smithsonian Learning Lab, I wonder if you want to send some of your um, you know, some of the documents that you showed us because there were people here taking pictures and people are nodding. So I think they would love to see that. So I'll talk with Antonia and see if we can post all of that in the Learning Lab collection from this conference. Okay, great. So, um, so our last presentation is M. Dolores Ramirez Verdugo, excuse my accent and Maria Puertas, and their presentation is called A Pedagogical Approach to Bilingual Early Childhood Education with Digital Storytelling. Okay, so again, we'll go 14 minutes, um, and I'll give you a warning at nine. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so what we're going to cover today is, um, how the theoretical principles of digital storytelling can be applied to early bilingual education, early bilingual childhood education. So we'll share with you um, the way we have been working. And uh, as a result, an outcome uh, will show some examples of, of the um, stories created by very young learners. Um, so some of the objectives uh, is actually to empower, to guide teachers to empower uh, those very young learners as emerging digital storytellers in bilingual context. Um, we'd like to provide teachers with orientations to use digital storytelling to support learners' language and content-integrated learning, which is CLEL, um, a very popular approach uh, in Europe um, and also here in Spain. Uh, in order to teach bilingual education um, in primary, secondary, and, and also pre-primary, as in, in the case that we have chosen to, to, to uh, illustrate today. So the purpose is to encourage learners to organize their ideas, emotions, knowledge, expressing them both in the first language and also in the second one. We consider uh, DST as a methodological strategy in order to promote the essential features of CLEO, uh, which are content, uh, communication, cognition, culture, 
in a holistic and meaningful way, as my um, uh, colleagues in the previous presentations have been mentioning. DST also help develop literacy, early literacy, while promoting peer collaboration and social skills. So while creating stories, um, they activate their prior knowledge and the knowledge about the world and consolidate what they already know. We are talking about three years old, four and five years old uh, kids. So it is also learning by discovery that tech, technological tools help both teachers and learners to create those stories. And we foster curiosity about the topic, about concept, linking it to both the prior knowledge and the new knowledge. So digital stories help us to explore the issues they are dealing with at, uh, in the classrooms in depth. It is relevant for CLIL in pre-primary settings because it helps uh, young learners to plan, to reflect, to research, to create and analyze, combining visual, visual images with written text. Um, so all of these are critical skills to develop in early childhood education. It also accelerates learning comprehension and can be applied in the classroom um, in order to tell personal stories, rating past events, or teaching a particular um, story. So uh, what we are presenting today is part of a uh, longitudinal research project within an international network on bilingual teacher education. And uh, this is part of what we call a STEAM, CLIL, digital storytelling uh, project-based learning. Um, the methodology is kind of cascade uh, cyclical teacher education network. So we analyze uh, needs at the schools and then uh, we try to face those challenges from teacher education. We uh, work with teacher education students who in their internship work directly in pre-primary, primary and secondary school. So, uh, the instructional method is um, based on the seven elements of digital storytelling by Lambert, adapted to early childhood in bilingual context. When we say adapted, uh, sometimes um, we use, obviously we need to support uh, very young learners by scaffolding their creative uh, process, by self-recorded stories or telling the story through other recorded stories or by symbolic play by crafting methods or transferring the, the oral story to, um, to the text, uh, to the visual information. So somehow scaffolding here is, is crucial where young learners are developing their emergent uh, literacy skills. We tend to use user-friendly technology, intuitive interfaces to improve uh, learning by helping learners create um, uh, their narratives and present and share um, in a more effective way. So with the community. So th this is a key thing and, and what uh, uh, is crucial in, in applying the method. So is they share with their, and they feel proud of sharing with their peers, teachers, family and friends. And that's very uh, powerful and meaningful for them. So um, some of the outcome uh, in order to, um, uh, share with you some of the findings, some of the outcomes. We have selected a couple of uh, very short uh, digital stories by uh, five-year-old and three-year-old um, children. So the first one... Alexander and the Unicorn. A young girl was walking in the forest. Suddenly, she heard a noise, went to see it, and found a unicorn. Alexandra asked him, would you like to be my friend? He said, okay. That is the end of the story. <laughs> so, so um, analyzing the story, very simple narrative structure. Uh, um, but it involves a setting, the forest, which is content uh, area in pre-primary education, an element of surprise, a sudden noise, 
Actions, being in the forest, creating meeting, asking questions, accepting an invitation, relevant social and, and emotional value of friendship, fictional and non-fictional characters, and then literacy, uh, literacy strategies used, past tenses, direct speech, uh, the, the story opening and closing patterns. She, uh, she gave her story a title and, and also um, uh, she somehow a, a sign of, uh, she signed it, uh, which is uh, uh, claiming her authorship. So um, she somehow was applying universal patterns of storytelling in her simple uh, narration. Um, in, in terms of uh, digital dimension of the story, she drew the, the illustration of the story plot uh, once scanned and digitized in this case, serve as the background for the video created, including her voice recording. And, and obviously, uh, in some cases, um, we, we need, uh, especially the very little ones, we need the, the language assistant or the teacher's assistant in the whole process. Very quickly, I'd like to share this one, three-year-old, and it's about lockdown. Marina, do you remember this picture? We are at home. Ah, estábamos en casa? Yes. Marina, what happened? The coronavirus is back. Marina, what happened? I'm happy with my friend. Are you in the park? No. In, in the school. And line the school. So in this case, um, it was quite relevant to hear to, to uh, students' voice, young learners' voice, and experiences about the current uh, global pandemic. Um, she, uh, it was a sequence of, of drawings created at the background, and um, and. It, it was very meaningful the way they were uh, able to express their feelings, uh, and that was only uh, a simple one. So uh, to conclude, um, actually, DST process is directly related to uh, the clear driving principles in bilingual education, creates a rich learning environment and supports learning linguistics, social, emotional, and digital competencies. We are talking about content, cognition, communication, culture in a very prominent way and, and, and involving both the digital storytelling and CLIL, adapting obviously them to pre-primary education in this case. Uh, this proves that uh, DST approach um, helps to develop literacy, including narrative competencies, uh, grammatical and phonological skills as well. Very valuable instrument to detect and identify potential difficulties in early uh, language and cognitive development, which is essential also in pre-primary education. And that multimodality associated with uh, digital tools allow children uh, to express their ideas using visual graphical representation to support their literacy uh, and as a scaffolding uh, research. Obviously, we, we keep on uh, examining and exploring stories and further research is still uh, necessary in order to um, develop a, a, a relevant conceptual framework. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and that's uh, what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. So